Yes, good evening to everybody. Welcome to the today class. That uh, I think that you are hearing me and you could see my uh, screen. What I posted over there. If you have seen it, please uh, tell me that what I posted on the screen. God use, 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 and forgive. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Anna. For that yeah. means it. Uh, yes, yes. I, I heard you. Uh, I heard you that uh, you are giving the. Uh, because there is a background, there is a lot of sound is there. That's why that I muted it. So in this class that we are discussing about that, uh, because I give the two uh, questions for each point of view, then uh, the first question which I dealt is the, what are the general principles of interpretation? Explain the literal or golden and which fool with the reported cases. This we did it in the last class. And uh, this class that I thought that I would like to deal with the language canons, but I waited for some time. But uh, again, with it, anyway, bet is, uh, late is better than never. And the remaining portion which I want to cover it, uh, which I am going to deal now, uh, this, that is the, yes, uh, we dealt yesterday, the, this case, Elliot versus Greg Kessler, that we dealt it because there is a parked uh, vehicle would be there and uh, that is jacked, uh, even though it is set to be the point where it can be made over there. And here, what I point is there, and uh, the point comes over here. Uh, the point comes over here is the yes, that I'm yes. Uh, whether whether this uh, will be applicable or not, we have to make it out. Uh, that is the th the thing which we want to make it out. The defendant car was parked with the road; it was jacked up and uh, had its battery removed. He was charged with an offence under the Road Traffic Act, 1930, of the using an uninsured vehicle on the road. The defendant argued that he was not using the car on the road as uh, clearly it was not a uh, drivable. Even though it is using the car or not, uh, it is not the question of it. Whether it is there on the road or not, which is causing the disturbance to other people, that will be count over there. Held the court applied the mischief rule and held that the car was being used on the road as it is uh, represented as a hazard, and therefore insurance would be required in the event of an accident. Even no nothing, no vehicle should be there on the road without the insurance because it is an obvious factor. Everybody knows it. So isn't it? So on that basis. Uh, Yes, it is. Uh, mischief can be used over there, and hence uh, uh, the car will be booked uh, under the Road uh, Traffic Act 1930. So, next case law that we want to see is the uh, Crockery versus Carpenter case law. And in this case law, the difference. Good. Yes, you are muted. Unmute yourself to speak. Okay. Screen and you mute it. Yes, you are muted. and mute yourself. I believe that you are hearing me, isn't it? Yeah, you are, you are hearing. You are hearing me in this case. Uh, yeah, and um, the point is here. Uh, he was in a drunken state. The crockery versus carpenter. That is a case law where the uh, person who is riding the bicycle. Well, it's under the influence of the alcohol, whether the bicycle or any other thing is concerned. But one should not supposed to drink and uh, uh, drive. Oh, that is the one thing that the health court uh, used the mischief rule, holding the riding was bicycle was within the mischief act, and uh, uh, the defendant was represented as a danger to himself and the road user, and hence uh, this uh, mischief can be used over there. So I believe that you are uh, you are hearing me, isn't it? Say yes or no. Yes. Give me the answer. Speak. I could not hear you. That's why I'm asking you. At least if you uh, you, you can uh, speaking, Marty Nagashar, you are speaking, but I could not hear your voice. Uh, but uh, can you chat? Can you chat, please? Because I could not hear your voice. Suppose if you are hearing my voice, then I can continue it. You can chat. You can chat. I say you can chat. If you are hearing my voice, then I may continue my class. I may continue my class. Yes. Yes, sir. Because Martin say yes, sir. Yes, sir means you are hearing us. Please write here. Write there. Sir, we are hearing you. 
Yeah, that is the right answer to write, uh, not yes or no, that is the right answer. You again say yes or no. Uh, sir, we are hearing you, that is the way of writing, uh, not yes sir. Uh. Okay, I may continue, yes sir, but, uh, but the, uh, the question that answer that you have given me, the yes sir. Okay, come to the point, uh, uh, DPP versus Bull, a man was charged with an offense under the section 11 of the Street Offense Act 1959, which make it an offense for a common prostitute to lighter or solicit a public street. And uh, the prosecution was made, the Street Offenses Act, it clearly says that uh, it is amount to the um, soliciting, the report may refer to the female prostitution, did not mention male prostitutes. So that was the thing which is made. The the QBD therefore held that the Mitchell Act, the act was aimed at was controlling the behavior of the only female prostitutes. Even male makes it or female makes it doesn't matter because solicit is a very important factor there. So the magistrate found him not guilty on the ground that a common prostitute only related to the females and not males. The prosecution appealed by the way of case stated the court held that the act did not apply to females. Uh, the court held that the act did not apply to females. The word prostitute was ambigu ambiguous and the applied the Michifrulu, the Street Offense Act was introduced as a result of the work of the uh, the Wolf and Land report into the homosexuality and prostitution. The report only referred to the female prostitution did not mention the male prostitute. The QBD, the QB Benz therefore held that the Michif Act was aimed at was controlling the behavior of only the female prostitutes. So now the question comes generally, uh, the act which is made for the prostitutes, then can it be applicable to the female prostitutes or male prostitutes? But the prostitute generally that will take the meaning of the uh, female prostitute only it will be applicable over there. Of course, there are rare occasions would be there, the male will be solicit, uh, that thing. But anyway, that case law is decided in that, uh, in that manner. So let us see the Ranji Dudeshi was the state of Maharashtra, that is the year 1965 Supreme Court 881, which is clearly mentioned, the appellant was convicted under section 292, that is the Indian Penal Court, for selling an obscene book uh, titled Lady Chatrier's Lover, so which is banned by the Indian government, the book is Lady Chatrier's Lover. He contended the prosecution has a, had a duty to prove guilty mind against him, which in his case is the knowledge that the uh, book contained the obscene material. So the question comes, uh, because of the uh, pornography was there, obscene material was there, there is a reason that the government of India is banned that book, uh, and if a person is selling such a book, uh, yes, definitely it will be attracted over there, even though he read the content or not. The appellant could not see or read all the book uh, content. The argument rejected by the Supreme Court and held that there was no ambiguity in the language of the enactment, that the meaning of the section 292 is the clear and uh, precise. Further, the Michi of the sale of the obscene literature was sought to be the remedy by the provisions and therefore the interpretation given by the appellant was uh, unacceptable. So that was the thing that means uh, when it is banned by the government of India, that means we are not supposed to sell it. Even though you read the book and without reading the book, you are not supposed to sell such a book because it is containing the pornographic material. So that is the case law which is said in the Arinji today, she was a state of Maharashtra, year 1965, Supreme Court 881. So let us see the another case law, the parallel versus Mahadio Ramchandra, year 1974, Supreme Court 228, a charge uh, um, under the Prevention of the Food Alteration Act 1954, that is the case law which is, uh, yes. It is the 1984 that the Food Alteration Act was brought against the appellant for selling and keeping for the sale supari. Yes, uh, of course, uh, because uh, when you speak, I could not hear your voice. That is only the difficulty that you have it. And uh, that is the reason uh, I could not ask you that what is supari. Supari means betel nut. So that is a betel nut uh, that is called the supari. Mute all, unmute all. It's, uh, I will say unmute all. Let me see that what the sounds I am getting over there. Yeah. So in the parallel of Mahadi or Ramchandra, there is a supari that he wants to sweeten supari with a banned artificial sweetener. They made it and the appellant argued that supari was not a food with the meaning of the act. The Supreme Court rejected his argument and held that supari is an article of food because it is, uh, it is uh, sweetened with artificial material which is banned one. And hence, uh, the attraction, uh, the the Food Alteration Act of 1954 would be applicable. It will be attracted because it is a food. The Supreme Court emphasized that the word "food" shall be should be interpreted in the context of the mischief with the Prevention of the Food Alteration Act of 1954. 
So in general, the supari is not said to be a food, but it is mixed with the sweetener which is banned by the government of India as the central government. At that instance, if it is mixed with the supari and uh, used for the selling, then uh, people uh, it will attract the meaning of the food. Hence, uh, uh, Food Alteration Act will be applicable over there. So these are the generally the golden rule and uh, the, in the sequence that the literary rule or grammatical rule we can say also the golden rule then the mischief rule. There is also a purposive rule also sometimes will be asked because that is not clearly mentioned over there in the syllabus but I would like to deal the purposive approach to statutory interpretation also. The purposive approach to statutory interpretation is used in the European Court of Justice and the literary rule would be already used in the European Court since there are so several languages in operation and translation not an exact the science, domestic judges are required to apply the purposive approach wherever they are applying the piece of the, the European uh, courts. Yes, well, let us see the, the one of the case law that is uh, Mount Cell versus Solins case law. The House of Lords had to determine whether the farm cottage attached to the farmhouse uh, constituted a premise or for the purpose of their intact. The Lord Simon set out the two tiers test to be taken under the purpose approach. Uh, I don't know whether you know the farmhouse which is adjacent to the farm. So constituted a premise, so it will come under the a premise of the house rent act or not. So Lord Simon said the first task of the court of the construction is to put itself in the shoe of the draftsman to consider what constitute the uh, he and uh, he had and uh, importantly what's uh, statutory objective he had being thus placed. The court proceeded uh, proceed to ascertain the meaning of the statutory language. Thus the purpose he approached to statutory law interpretation seeks to look for the purpose of the legislation before uh, interpreting the words. It has uh, often been said that the purpose he approach is a mixture of the domestic rules. However, the, whereas the domestic rules require the courts to apply the literal rule First, look at the wording of the act. The purpose approach starts with the mischief rule in seeking the purpose or the intention of the parliament. So, it is therefore a much more flexible approach, giving the judges a greater scope to develop the law in line with the, what uh, they pursued uh, to be uh, parliamentary intention. So, purpose approach more re readily embraces uh, the use of the extrinsic aids. Here, extrinsic aid means uh, external aids to assist in finding the parliament intention. For example, in the relaxing the rule in the reference to the Hansard, in Pepper versus Hard, this is the case law, where the Hansard or the external sources would be there, external aids, that can be used um, by that, uh, this Hans, uh, Pepper versus Hart, uh, House of Lord adopted this purpose. Let us see that uh, what it is done in this case law. There's Pepper versus Hart, uh, that is the case law, WLR, that uh, weekly law reporter, and uh, the House of uh, House of Lords, they said, uh, had to decide whether they are teacher. A teacher at a private school had to pay tax on the perks he received in the form of uh, reduced school fees. Yes, the question comes over there. Whatever the perks will be given by a teacher in a, in a private school, uh, which is in the form of the perks, uh, whether it should be taxable or not. So that is the question in this case law. The teachers sought to rely upon their statement in Hansard which is uh, parliamentary debates, uh, rather we can say in other words, uh, made uh, all the time the uh, the Finance Act was passed. In the yearly, the Finance Act will be passed. And for every Finance Act, there will be a debate will be there. So that will be uh, parliamentary debates, we can say, in one form, in another form. And uh, it was passed in which the minister gave his exact circumstances as being the where tax would not be payable. Where the tax would be payable, where the tax will not be payable in the debate it is clearly mentioned. So previously the courts were not allowed to refer the answer. So earlier they did, uh, the external aid could not be used over there, but now it is used. So that is why the, the House of Lords departed from the Davis versus Johnson, that is a case law, where the answer could not be used as an external aids. That is the extrinsic aids, but uh, in this case law of the paper hurt, it can be used as an external aid and they overruled the Davis versus Johnson case law and took the purpose approach to interpretation uh, holding that the Hansard may be referred to and uh, the teacher was not required to pay the tax on the perks he received. So it is clearly mentioned in the parliamentary debates with the, the finance minister that uh, the perks will not be taxed. That is the clearly mentioned over there. So they have taken the external aids and they said that the teacher will not come under the definition of the tax to be paid for the perks which is received. So Lord Griffith on the purpose approach, uh, 
The day have passed when the courts adopted a literal approach. The court used the purposive approach which seeks to give the effect to the purpose of legislation and are prepared to look at the much extraneous material that bears upon the background against which the legislation was enacted. Suppose if the legislation is not clearly mentioned whether to be taxed or not taxed, then the internal aids as well as the external aids can be used over there by that uh, a problem will be solved by, by using the another approach that is said to be the purposive approach. So here the Lord Brown Willingson on reference of Hansard, he said, my lords, I have come to the conclusion that as a matter of law, there are sound reasons for making the limited modification to the existing rule subject to the strict safeguards unless there are the constitutional or practical reasons which outweigh them. So in my judgment, he clearly mentioned, subject to the question of the privileges of the House of Commons, uh, reference to the parliamentary material should be permitted as an aid to the construction of the legislation which is ambiguous or obscure or the literal meaning of which leads to an absurdity. Even such a case as a reference to the court of the parliamentary material should also be permitted. So it is given in there clearly that yes, Hansard can be used as a external aids so that can be solve the problem. Uh, that is a purposive approach which can be used over the uh, literary approach and which is approach, a new approach uh, may be made that is said to be a purposive approach. The courts are required to apply the purposive approach when interpreting the the EU, especially European Union laws, the courts are used in, when interpreting the domestic legislation given the interpretation line. So, uh, the reason of our studying is no, uh, as an academic point of view, um, you have to study the all in the other countries also uh, what the approaches would be there. So, with that view that we dealt with that case law. The, the Pickstone versus Freemans, there is another case law where the Miss Pickstone brought a claim against her employer under the Equal Pay Act 1970. Actually, she was employed as a warehouse operative and was paid the same as a male warehouse operative. Here, warehouse means go-downs, where we are taking care of the go-downs. The male also given the same, uh, the Equal Pay Act 1970, but when she is a female, the pay is less to her, it is made. However, Ms. Parkinson claimed that uh, the work of the warehouse operative was of equal value to that done by male warehouse checkers who were paid the pounds 1.22 per week more than she was. So the male will be paid the more salary than the female. So that was the case which is happened in this case law. That's why she challenged it and brought the case to the House of Lords. The House of Lords decided that the literal approach would have left the United Kingdom in the breach of its uh, treaty obligation to give effect to the EU directives. Uh, it therefore used the purposive approach and stated that Ms. Parkinson, the Pickstone was entitled to claim on the basis of the work of equal value even though there was a male employee uh, doing the same work as her. So that was the thing. There's the purpose of approach would be there. Both are doing the same thing. There should not be a bias towards the male and the female. And there the purpose of approach is used by this court in the Pickstone versus Freeman PLC. So let us see the another case law R versus S of the health expert uh, where the quanti, the quanta valley on behalf of the pro-life alliance WLR House of Lords so this is also clearly mentioned there, the human fertilization, that is the call, the pro-life alliances argued that the human fertilization embryology authority did not have authority to license research with regard to the cloning. If the human cloning, of course, it is banned. Um, yeah, the human fertilization and the uh, embryological act 1990 granted the authority to a right to license research with the regard to the embryos and an embryo was defined as the act as a live human embryo where the fertilization is complete. However, embryos created using the cloning are not fertilized. So the human cloning is almost all, the many countries banned over there, but still people are doing, but instead of doing the, uh, elevating the, what is that, remove the party, that would be quite good, uh, that, um, uh, what, uh, what I say, the activity should be done rather than the creating a, a going against the nature would not uh, be a good uh, as per my opinion is concerned. Okay. Held that the clone, the House of Lords held that the cloned embryos were covered by the statute, taking a purposey approach to statute integration. So even the cloning embryos come under that uh, statute, uh, but uh, animal cloning will be allowed over there. So that was the, the purposey approach will be used in this cloning. The court, uh, the Lord Brigham, they said, the court's task within the permissible bounds of interpretation is to give the effect the parliamentary purposes. So, 
the controversial provision should be read in the context of the statute as a whole and the statute as a whole should be read in the historical context of the situation which led it to its enactment yes when you want to read the provision you read the entire statute when you want to read the entire statute please see that why the statute is uh, enacted i want to see the what is the historical background for that enactment of the statute so that was the while it is impressive to us where the parliament would have done if the facts have been before there is one important question which may be permissible be asked uh, is it whether the parliament faced with the taxing task of the enacting legislation solutions to the difficult regions morals and scientific issues mentioned above so here the advantages and disadvantages also we can see whether so let us see the advantage of the purposive approach is it is flexible approach which allows the judges to develop the law in line with the parliament intention that is observed in the monsell versus wallins case law then the second point it allows the judges to cope with the situation unforeseen by the parliament that is a quanta velle case law is made so uh, unforeseen uh, situation comes over there how the uh, meaning will be extended over there under the purposive approach so the third point also clearly means it allows the law to develop to cover the advances in medical sciences yes in the medical sciences very advances would be there at that instance the purpose approach can be used it allows the courts to give effect to the eu directives that is the clearly mentioned the pickstone versus freeman's case law then the last one is allowing the reference to hansard that is nothing but the parliamentary debates make it easier for the courts to discover the parliament intention that is observed in the paper versus hart case law so those are the advantage of the purpose approach so let us see that is the advantage of the purpose approach also there and the judges are given so much power to develop the law and there at the time they are usurping the power of the parliament means the taking over the power of the parliament means encroaching on the power like that's why can usurping that word is can be uh, usurping u yes u r p a n g so number one they just become the law makers here because uh, uh, actually the law makers are the parliament peers and they just only will promulgate the law or uh, apply the law with uh, by giving the different uh, interpretation to the statute with the what intention the parliament has made or enacted such a statute so what i want to say here is judges becomes uh, the law makers here because of this approach uh, that is a disadvantage and infringes the separation of the powers of the montesquieu theory which is the separation of powers would be there so that the purpose of approach uh, will be will be that disadvantage that is the first one the second disadvantage is that there is a scope for the judicial bias in deciding the what the parliament intended so uh, the parliamentary intention may be one way that if these uh, judges were given a such a power then they will give a different uh, meaning and stretches the meaning in a different way uh, depending upon the context uh, so judicial bias also be there there is a second uh, disadvantage of the purpose of approach the third uh, disadvantage is it assume the parliament has one intention and ignore the fact that the parliament is divided on the party lines so the intention of the parliament is one angle but the if the judges make that angle in the, apply the angle in a different uh, scenario in sense uh, then also is a disadvantage of the purpose approach the last point is uh, allowing the references to the hansard that is the parliamentary debates and which is uh, formed into the book form may be led to the prolonged examination of the relevant material by lawyers because the debates are in volumes and uh, days also to be taken so the lawyers would add to the cost and length of the litigations uh, so in the paper versus hard will be there then it is difficult to maintain it of course now the paper uh, maintenance will not be possible over there because uh, now the digital world is there but digital india is there that everything would be in a soft form uh, yes so it's a soft uh, copy that's uh, what i want to say is uh, which is uh, not easily to be destroyed uh, so that was the thing which uh, will we'll come across over there then we'll see what is the another point uh, for allowing this hansard so we saw the advantages as well as the disadvantage of the purpose approach so in addition to uh, to the linear uh, that is the literary rule and uh, then comes to the golden rule then comes the mitchif rule and we also cover the purpose rule also suppose the question will be asked the 15 marks and if they, they say the general principle of uh, the interpretation of statute uh, regarding the rules are concerned yes you can write the literary rule which is also set with the grammatical uh, 
rule and let you say the the next is the golden rule then next comes the mischief rule then the last one is said to be the purpose rule so with its uh, uh, case loss cited over there and you have to mention that case loss uh, then it will be a quite good answer so with that uh, i can say uh, that question number two is concerned yes so what other general principles of interpretation explain the literal golden and mitchu but added the purpose you approach also so now the time is 536 but here only one way traffic it is there because i could not uh, hear your uh, yes sir we are hearing you having the problem the keyboard in my mobile sir okay okay i noted it but uh, at, at least now also i could not hear your voice yeah, if anyone can say that uh, sir uh, can speak with me so that i could know whether you are hearing me in a proper way or not yes anyone anyone can unmute and speak uh, so there is uh, i did not press anything uh. yeah 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 yes yes uh. Yes, now, 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 yeah, now he can speak. Yes, can you speak with me? Speaking, Dai Dai Yakubu, but I could not hear you speak, Dai Dai Yakubu. Okay, 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 but uh, at least you are hearing me. Yes, uh, because this uh, chart says we are hearing you, but I could not hear your voice. So today it's one-way traffic. It is there. No, no, I don't want the, my uh, online class to be one-way traffic because I want that uh, my class should be a participating class where the students should have to give the promptness. Yes, they are following it and they are participating also in the class. That's why that I would like to conduct the class. So. Uh, because I did not hear even the people are present. The Yakub is present. And Martin Nageshwara is present. But uh, the other people, I would like to see whether I, I want to stretch it so that I could see that. Uh, yes, uh, Sheshagiri, because I could not see Nageshwar Rao's uh, microphone, but I could saw the Daida Yakub microphone. Yes, uh, Daida Yakub, can you? Yes, uh, yeah, I could not hear your voice. I think that you are speaking. Yes, pl please speak. Yes, because I did not press anything here. Yeah, with this uh, today's class, I would like to wind it up. Uh, sir, I am not able to hear voice, please. Sir, not able to hear voice, please. So, you are not hearing my voice, is it? But how come it will be there? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me check it. Okay, okay. This is one way. Yeah, at least, can you hear me now? Because there is some button would be there. Right? There's a plus minus, which is increasing. And this is the, yes, it is increasing only. Yes. And this is the phone. Yeah. So anyway, with this, uh, yeah, I could not hear your voice. That's my problem. So with this, uh, I would like to stop it. And tomorrow class, uh, we will see that, uh, um, the Karen, that second one, yeah, which uh, I want to make it out, then I will show you. Yes, the chart. Yeah, in, in my next class tomorrow that we will see the, explain the nutshell with example, the language canons under the general principle of interpretation, that is a unit two, question number four, we will deal it tomorrow. With that, I would like to say bye to you, and uh, because today class is this much is enough for a, uh, because I could not hear your voice, that makes me the more trouble to me. So let me give the thank you slide to you, so that I would say goodbye to you. Yes, thank you slide that I would like to make to you. Yes, thank you very much for your patient listening. And even though we did not participate today, but I heard that you are you are hearing my voice. So with that, I will close down the today class and see you tomorrow. Yes, end of the class, end of the meeting.